I'm honored, honored to be first here, honored to be among educators. I am, uh, hope to be somewhat of an educator. I grew up with parents. When I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear uh, and decided that moment I wanted to become a writer. And so that moment changed my life. I remember in high school, I wanted to date a woman named Bernice and she didn't want to date me, she dated some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. And so <laughs> my values were set. Um, then when I was 17, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Um, and so the, the best thing about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. And so uh, that really was the forming institution of my life. I had a double major there in history and celibacy uh, while I was at Chicago. Um, and it really shaped who I am. And so even now, I'm somewhat cerebral. I'm more cerebral. I'm on TV, but on the PBS NewsHour, which is sort of the cerebral version of TV. I do a, a segment called Shields and Brooks, uh, if anybody's seen it on Friday nights. Um, uh, we wanted to call it Brooks Shields. That would have been better, but um, they didn't go for that. Um, but uh, it's, it caters to an audience that has some experience. Uh, has seen the world a little. Uh, if, uh, I know if a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say to me. I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. <laughs> and so we're very big in the hospice community there. Um, and then I write sort of a cerebral column. I'm a, I was hired as a conservative columnist at the New York Times, which is a job I liken to being the chief rabbi in Mecca. Not always a lot of company there. But, um, but, uh, and so my life has been organized around books. Uh, and about teaching and reading, I get to teach at Yale University because I only teach at places I couldn't have gotten into. Um, and uh, as, my, as I've gotten a little older, uh, my books have gotten, I, I think my taste has gotten a little more feminine, more sensitive. I'm the only American man who finished that book, Eat, Pray, Love, if you know that book. Uh, by page 123, I was actually lactating, which was amazing. Um, and then I wrote a book recently called uh, The Road to Character, uh, and I learned writing that book that writing a book on character doesn't give you good character. Uh, and even reading a book on giving on good character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on good character does give you good character. So I recommend that. And then I have another book coming out in a few weeks called The Second Mountain, which is a, a little led into my work, what we're going to do here. And so a lot of my life has been writing. And so a lot of writing is lonely. John Cheever was a writer who got up in his apartment in New York. He got dressed in the morning, put on a suit, rode the elevator down to the basement, took off the suit, wrote in his boxers, and then wrote all morning, and then he put on the suit and wrote up for lunch. That was his day. And so writing is a necessary sort of solitary thing. And so I've sort of steered myself, unfortunately, in a solitary direction. And then I was more successful than I ever thought I would be, so my last book did very well, and I was on a book tour for 99 days. And in the course of that, I counted 42 meals that I, in consecutive, that I ate alone, either at a hotel, airplane, or airport. And I was totally unmoored. And I remember around that time, Britney Spears sort of went crazy and chopped off all her hair. And I was like, yeah, I get that. I could do that. I could do that. So you get alone. And some of us get cut off from other people. And then I'm surrounded, as we all are, in a culture of individualism, culture that sees life as an individual journey, that tells us to be, try to be self-sufficient, authentic to ourselves, and maybe not always as connected to others as we should be. We're trapped in a meritocracy, which tells us we can win praise if we achieve, and that success is sort of a series of inner rings toward the people who are most successful. And workaholism becomes a very effective distraction from any emotional and spiritual problem. And so I was leading my life and was drifting off in the wrong direction. Uh, I came to idolize time over people. I wanted to be so efficient, I was always on the move, but nobody was ever able to attach to me, nor I to anybody else. And so the wages of sin are sin. If you lead a life with bad values, it'll eventually bite you in the ass. And so in 2013, uh, I had a bad period. Uh, my marriage ended, my kids were leaving home, I was part of the conservative movement, but my kind of conservatism wasn't the popular kind, so those social circles drift away. And so I was humiliated and isolated and alone. And I turned to work to solve all my problems. If you went into my apartment where I was living alone, I, and if you pulled in the drawer where there should have been forks and knives, there were post-it notes. And if you pulled in the drawer where there should have been plates, there was stationery. 
I was just work. And so I was down in the valley. And I learned a couple of things which have informed my life since and even informed our work here. The first is freedom sucks. Political freedom is great. Economic freedom is great. Social freedom sucks. If you're unattached, if you're uncommitted to things, you're unremembered and your life is not amounting to anything. So I had completely open options. It sucked. The second thing I learned is that when you're down in the valley, you can either be broken or you can be broken open. And the people who are broken just don't deal with their pain. They just get smaller. They shrink in in fear and grievance and resentment toward the world. There's a great phrase, pain that is not transformed gets transmitted. And so if you don't deal with your pain, you just turn it into anger to other people. But other people are broken open. There's a 1950s theologian who said, named Paul Tillich who said that pain and those seasons of suffering we all go through are interruptions in life and they remind you you're not the person you thought you were. They carve beneath, between the floor of what you thought was the basement of your soul and they reveal a cavity below that and they carve below that and they reveal a cavity below that. And when you peer down in the parts of yourselves you didn't even aware of, you become aware that only spiritual and emotional food will fill those cavities. And so what you're in those seasons, two things leap out to you, that your conscious mind is only the third most important part of your consciousness. The first is the desiring heart, the desires of your heart. I read about a guy who had a bamboo stand in his driveway and he tried to, he hated bamboo, so he chopped it down, took an ax to the root system, poured plant poison in the hole, three feet of gravel, six inches of concrete. Two years later, little shoot of bamboo coming up. And in my view, we all have that. We have our desires. If you go to a school play, fourth graders, and you look at them ferociously con concentrating on their performance, trying to be great, they have that desire. We sometimes try to pave over their desires, but it sneaks through. And what we desire, what the heart desires more than any, anything else, is fusion with another. What Louis de Bernier described in his book, Captain Corelli's Mandolin, he's got an old guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And the old guy says, love itself is what is left over when being in love is burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew towards each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we discovered that we we're one tree and not two. That's what the heart desires, some deep connection with another human being. The other important faculty you discovered in those moments is the soul. Now, I'm not a pastor or a rabbi. It's not my job to tell you to believe in God or not. But I do ask you to believe that you have a soul. I ask you to believe that there's some piece of you that has no shape, size, color, or weight, but it is of infinite value and dignity. And rich and successful people don't have more of this than the rest of us. That slavery is wrong because it's an obliteration of another human being's soul. That rape is not just an attack on a bunch of physical molecules. It's an attack on someone's soul. That anything that's obscene covers over somebody else's soul. And what the soul does is it gives us moral responsibility. A tiger's not morally responsible for what it does, but we are. And second, it yearns. It yearns for righteousness. I've interviewed all sorts of people in my life who are criminals and conducted war, did horrible things. They all want to believe they have a good life. We all want to orient our lives towards some good. You all went into this field not because it could make the most money, because you wanted to orient your life around right relation and some good. And so when you discover that part of yourself, you've fallen into yourself and you're in the valley. Now our society happens to be in a valley. We're in a society where 35% of Americans are chronically lonely, 50% of Americans say no one knows them well, the suicide rate has risen by 30% over the last uh, 20 years, the teenage suicide rate, those 7 to 17, has risen by 70% in the last 15 years, 70%. 45,000 Americans kill each other every year, 72,000 die of opiate addiction. We don't trust each other, and we do what humans do when they're naked and alone, they revert to tribe. Uh, when you're just looking for some community, tribalism is what our evolutionary roots tell us to do, and tribe seems like community, but it's the opposite of community. It's ba not based on mutual affection, it's based on mutual hatred. 
It's us, them, friend, enemy, build walls, erect barriers. And so about the time I was in my own valley, I saw this as our whole society going into a valley. And how do you get out of it? Four steps. The first, as I said before, is you have to be willing to be broken open. You have to be willing to go down to the lower level of yourself, and you, what you discover there is your illimitable ability to care for each other. Deep down, everybody I've ever met wants connection, and they want to care for each other if you get down to that sacred place. Second, you have to be willing to be led. In my view, you can't pull yourself out of your valley. Somebody reaches in and pulls you out. For me, I was invited to a, a family named Kathy and David in Washington, D.C. Uh, and they uh, had a kid in the D.C. public schools who had a friend named James whose mom had some health and drug issues, so didn't have food. And so they said, well, James can stay with us. And James stayed with them, and then James had a friend, and that kid had a friend. And five years ago, the first time I went to dinner with them, I, uh, uh, met, I walked into the room, and there were 15 kids sleeping downstairs and 40 around the dinner table. And I reached out to hold out my hand to somebody, uh, a kid named Ed, and he said, we really don't shake hands here. We hug here. And I'm not the most huggiest guy on the face of the earth, <laughs> but I've been going back every Thursday, and I've been hugging them. And what we do is we sit around a table every Thursday, and we share what's going on in our lives. Some of it's good, passed a GED, got a job. Some of it's bad, depression. Uh, one uh, young lady needed it. Her kidney was failing, and so David, the father in this group, uh, gave her a kidney, and I took my daughter there, and she said, that's the warmest place I've ever been. I took a guy named Bill Milliken, who started communities and schools, and he said, I've been doing youth work for 50 years. I've never seen a program turn around life. I've only seen relationships turn around lives. And being part of that community lifted me out, because they demanded int emotional intimacy. And so now, part of my work at Weave, the Social Fabric Project with the Aspen Institute, is to find people like that all around the country. And the great thing is, wherever we go, and you're about to meet two of them, we find them. There are people who are living for good, for community, for right relation with others. There's a woman named Aisha Butler in Chicago. She was about to move out of the Englewood neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, and she saw two girls playing with broken bottles in a vacant lot across the street. And she told her husband, we're not leaving. We're not going to be just another family that left those people behind. And she now runs a, a community organization there. There's a guy named Mac McCarter who's in Shreveport, Louisiana. There are about 250,000 people in Shreveport. He's got 55,000 volunteering at his organization. I met a woman in Ohio, one of the more searing events of the trip, uh, named Sarah, whose husband had killed their two kids and himself. And she decided that she was going to devote her life to service. She told us, I grew from this experience because I was angry. I was going to fight back at what he tried to do to me by making a difference in the world. See, he didn't kill me. My response to you is whatever you meant to do to me, fuck you, you're not going to do it to me. And she leads a life of service. And what they're doing is building connection and building relationship where there had been isolation. There's an organization a lot of you probably know called Roots of Empathy, started by Mary Gordon. And they take infants and moms and put them on green carpets and then have kids look at the little infants, try to guess what they're doing. And that's a way to teach empathy. They're entering the mind of the infant. And one day there was a kid named Darren who was a little older than the others because he'd been held back two years. He'd been through the foster care system, and seen his mom killed. And he wanted to hold the baby. Uh, and the mom was nervous because Darren was so scary. But she let him. He took the baby over to the windowsill, and he cradled it on his chest, and he was great with the baby. And he came back and handed the baby back to the mom and started asking about what it's like to be a father. And the last question was, if nobody has ever loved you, do you think you can still be a good father? Because no one had ever loved him. And so we're people seeing people solve that problem. They're building relationship. The problem is relationship, it's intimate. It takes a long time. It doesn't scale. But norms scale. If you can change the culture, then you can change, have the big effect on society. And what I found, whether it's Red or Blue America, we see these weavers, they have the same set of values. They believe in radical mutuality. We're all equal. We're all broken together. They believe in deep relationality, deep hospitality. Often, they walked out of corrupt systems. They have a set of values that we try to describe on our website. 
uh, which is Weave the Social Fabric Project. And all we need to do is shine a light on them. We need to lift them up and say, maybe we should all be a little more like this. Not radically, a little more. Maybe we should learn about their values and try to live a little more in those values. Culture changes when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy them. These people have found a better way to live. And for me, who is lonely, it's been a salvation. For a nation that's lonely, it's a salvation. And it's the way forward. History moves when you fix the culture, then you fix the institutions, and then you fix the politics. We've got to fix the culture first, and these people are showing us how to do it, and the rest of us just have to be part of the conversation. Thank you. I'm going to be joined up here by uh, Dan Porterfield, who is the president of the Aspen Institute, and by Lisa, who is Apex from New Orleans, and by Darius Baxter, who is from The Good Project in Washington, D.C. Well, thank you, David, for that fantastic opening. In fact, never has an introduction put more pressure on the speakers <laughs> and David's explication that the weavers are the future of the country and all we have to do is listen to them and learn from them. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, which is a leadership development and convening organization based in Washington, D.C. that's working in communities around the country on the most pressing issues of the day. David Brooks's work in developing and leading the Weave Project is one of maybe 60 different major initiatives we have that are all about trying to create a free, just, and equitable society. Um, and clearly, the two of you are doing it in a big way. So what I'd like to do is interview Lisa and Darius first for a few minutes, then bring David back into the conversation, and then open it up for you. And we have until about start with uh, Reverend Lisa Fitzpatrick from Apex. Can you tell us first uh, about what your work is? What is it you do? Yes, Dan. Apex is a drop-in youth center. And by drop-in, we have two rules for entrance. You found the front door, and you brought no weapons inside. Um, we are intentional about building relationships, reconciling transformational relationships within our community. And we work with teens in Central City, ages 12 to 25, and young adults and their families. Based in New Orleans. Based in New Orleans. There's a big party this week in New Orleans, I think. Thank yes, you for there joining is. us. <laughs> and um, uh, how did you get started with Apex? W what made this happen? Well, it was quite accidental, and I had been brought to New Orleans as a healthcare executive to help rebuild hospitals after the storm. Um, shortly after, when I say shortly after, within 24 hours, two teenagers showed up at my house because I had two lovely teenage daughters, and they were curious. And two turned into 10, turned into 20, until I counted 35 kids in my den on a Saturday, all ages. And I asked one of them, why are you hanging out with this old woman on a Saturday afternoon? And what he said struck me. He said, because you're the first person that ever opened the door. Yeah. And I was floored. How had we reached that in our society? Why were there not more open doors? And what were, what were they doing there? So food, pizza, and hot dogs, and teenagers will come. Yeah. <laughs> um, mostly we had young men until all the girls figured out where all the cute boys were, and then they came. Playing, 16-year-olds who had all their toys washed away in the storm were playing Legos. Uh, riding bikes and just building relationships. Yeah. Now you're also uh, a minister, and could you say a little bit about the connection of this work, if there is one, to your, your faith life? Absolutely. Um, I always call it my first calling, my second career. Yeah. And out of Apex, those same teenagers in Central City, New Orleans, one day said, you know that church thing you do? We want to do it too and they formed the church that I pastor. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, 
One more question, then I'll turn to Darius. It gets a little bit at where David was, was introducing you. Um, so why do you do this? Why did Apex come into being um, is one question, but why did you bring Apex into being is another one. Uh, I ask myself that a lot. Uh, if you would have told me that I would be doing this now, 15 years ago, I'd have said you're crazy. But why? Because of those young men and women who led me, who taught me, who healed me and my own broken relationships and taught me what it truly meant to be in relationship one with another. I heard a story about your having been um, the random victim of a violent act of some children, some young people. Could, uh, could you say what that was and just how that fits into this whole mosaic? Well, when I first got into this work as a public health educator in the 90s, I worked with gang members. But prior to that, I had literally an eye-opening experience. Um, passenger in a vehicle, I was shot in the face um, in a random gang initiation drive-by. I had the blessing, and I say it's a blessing, I had the blessing to see the two young children who carried the gun. They were terrified, Dan. Um, I realized that I was not the victim, and I will not use that with me. I was not the victim. I was collateral damage yeah. in a war that I didn't start and that they didn't start. And I wanted from that moment on, which is why I got into public health, to find a way, how had our community gotten so broken that two children who couldn't have been more than 10 or 11 felt that their only option that night was to kill or be killed. Thank you, thank you. Um, Darius Baxter, I uh, happened to go to one of the greatest colleges in America, Georgetown University, yeah. in <laughs> yeah. my alma mater. Oh, yes, accent. And um, uh, you, you, at Georgetown University, Yep. You took some great classes. You worked in a number of programs in the city of Washington, yep. uh, your hometown. Uh, yep. Played some football, rehabbed some injuries while playing lot, some football. A lot of injuries. We were talking about this in the back. Yep. You said, did you play football? I said, I was on the team. I watched a lot of football. <laughs> <laughs> and, th and then, out of all the accumulated experiences before college and college, yep. not too far out of college, you and two friends created an organization. Uh, that's called Good Projects. Yeah. So tell us first, what does Good Projects do? Wow, that's, that's a good question. And I just want to start by saying just how grateful I am. Uh, I, was, I was joking with Lisa in the back because I don't think either one of us knew <laughs> what we were being brought here for. <laughs> David, David was joking. He said, you know, we did this on purpose. We didn't want to... <laughs> But literally got an email about a week ago saying, hey, yeah, can you come to Austin for a panel? I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Thought we'd be at a dinner, and now we're sitting before about 2,100 people at yeah. the morning. Pretty cool. Uh, uh, Another million watching online. Really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for that, Dan. Thanks no, for that. No, no pressure. No, no pressure. No pressure. Uh, but uh, so in January 2016, me and my two buddies, Danny and Troy, um, we were challenged by a mentor of ours. We were products of um, environments of Washington, D.C., similar to the ones that we work in now. And we knew that we didn't want to follow the typical path of um, Georgetown students. Nothing wrong with that path, you know, but typically students move into either consulting or they go off to Wall Street. Uh, those things are important because they fund our programs. Yeah, yeah. So for all those millions out there watching, you know, yeah. goodprojects.org. Yeah. <laughs> But at the end of the day, we knew we wanted to do something more. We wanted to make it so that the three of us who had somehow found a way um, through a number of different avenues to make it to Georgetown and now as we approach graduation, to make it so that we weren't the exceptions to the rule of what could happen from these communities, but we were the example of what could happen from these communities. Beautiful. Um, and again, we were joking in the back because you asked this question. For us, it was never this goal to go out there and to start an organization, um, to be at a point now where um, we have a staff of about 25. Um, our budget is ever growing. It was that we wanted to go out there and solve problems. Yeah. Um, the original problem for us, uh, and, and you've hit on it perfectly, was this issue of gun violence. Mm -hmm. Where why is there so many young people being either the perpetrators or the victims of gun violence? And for us, the initial initiative was the summer program that we ran. Mm -hmm. From there, we transitioned into working in the juvenile justice space because we realized the connection there. And now, in partnership with the Ford Foundation, we're working on a project 
to essentially create a model to end poverty in the District of Columbia. Yeah, so you're almost moving up the river, further up the river to see the causes of consequences that you began by addressing. Certainly, Dave, David and I have had these conversations actually when he visited DC, and we were using the analogy of uh, the, we've all heard this one before, that when the starfish wash on the beach, and there's the onlooker looking over the ridge and he sees somebody on the beach running up and down and throwing something, throwing something, he comes close and he sees that he's throwing these starfish back into the water, and he asks him, what are you doing? He's like, all oh, these starfish washed up on the shore. I'm saving them. And he throws another one back. And he says, it's not possible that you can save all these starfish. And he just keeps chucking them. For us, it wasn't enough to just be the guy on the beach throwing the starfish back one by one. We wanted to be the group of guys that got the dinghy, drove out to the middle of the ocean, <laughs> saw the oil rig that was polluting the water, bringing all the starfish on, attaching TNT to that bad boy and blowing <laughs> it up. You know? so, that's what we wanted to be. Cool, OK. So, <laughs> so say. There's another step back then. Yeah. Why? I, I get the work. I get the, the, the way the work has unfolded. Mm -hmm. But why you? Why aren't you the one on Wall Street right now funding other people's programs? Uh, it, it's a constant battle. Uh, it's in the society that we lived in, and we've touched on that across the Weave Project, is that we live in a culture in America that's really spread out globally um, with Western culture where it's always, I need more, I need more, I need more, I need more, specifically in reference to capital, money. But for us, it's shifting that narrative and saying, okay, is my value in the world defined by how much money I have or is how much that I can provide for others? Okay, so why do you believe that? Uh, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. I'm a Christian through and through. I was raised in the church um, and was raised in a house of love. And across religion, whether you're Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, uh, you know, flying spaghetti monster, whatever it might be, there's this, this similar narrative that the more that you give, the more that you receive. And throughout my entire life, whether it was when I was young and I was nine and my father was shot and killed, and I could have went a completely different path. Um, but I always turn back to love. I always turn back to giving because that's what I was taught. And by the grace of God, the more that I've given to this world, the more that I receive. Look at me right now. 25 years old, and I sit before a crowd of, apparently there's millions of people watching, you know? <laughs> yeah, sure. but, yeah. but here I stand, yeah. and this is, a, no, this is no, nothing that I've done has gotten me on this stage. Yeah. It's been simply leading with love, leading with my heart, and it's allowed a great opportunity. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Michelle Obama's watching right now, actually. <laughs> What's up, Michelle? <laughs> hey, Barack. You know, you know they live in D.C., yes, so we're basically do. neighbors. Yeah, exactly. You got them for a few more years. So, so David, has offered, offered a framework mm -hmm. within which the two of you sit. And um, he sees in your lives, as well as your work and your values, a set of shared beliefs, shared commitments, mm -hmm. that he hopes lots more people will choose to emulate. Because the way you're living is a way that he believes inspires him personally, but can inspire our country to find its soul again. But you two have not even met before, right? <laughs> Just backstage, <laughs> separated at birth. <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty twins. Cool. You didn't know? Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. So, so many what? Years apart. Many years <laughs> apart. So, so Lisa, what do you think when you're sitting here, brought here by David, and you hear Darius? talk about his beliefs and his values. I love that he speaks of justice. The dinghy in the ocean is justice. Um, the person on the beach is mercy, and we need both, because one goes with another. But if we don't find the cause of what is disconnecting us, we'll continue to just be those who are trying to save instead of those who are trying to create yeah. community. Um, I hear one of the things that we do at Apex, which is co-creating. Uh, we don't do things to and for people. We don't believe that that is where we can be. Yeah. I hear things of co-creation, that we are in this journey with one another, not to and for one another. Yeah. And um, I am grateful that there are young men uh, and women, and there's so many. How do we empower that space yeah. for this next generation? Yeah. Finding causes, co-creation, working across the generations. Yes. What do you hear when you 
hear Lisa speak. I hear a champion. I hear a champion. For many people that went through the situation that you went through, where she could have been someone who became so bitter and broken and say, why did this happen to me? But what all of us have to do in our lives and every single day is find purpose. Yeah. In that instant, when you were shot, you found purpose and you found meaning. And you said, these young people, they're, they're ten, would you say 10 and 11 years old? Couldn't, it took two of them to raise the gun. For her to have the forethought and the insight and the compassion to say that these young people are not acting in their own right, but they're products of a system, and I have to do something to try to fix this system, that is something that's so profound. And that right there is restorative justice. And we need to see more of that in every aspect of our life. And I, I sit and I bow down to your greatness. Um, so David has been traveling the country um, looking to meet people whose work you can draw into relation to one another for our larger good. Um, and Lisa, will you say something about how you met David Brooks? I got this email from the Aspen Institute yeah. that invited me to dinner and invited not just me, but invited two of our young people to come. We went to this beautiful dinner at an art gallery and sat around with one another and shared our stories of community and of relationship and you just felt this movement and the space for our kids to have this voice among people who they hadn't previously had access to was incredible. And I thank you for that. And that's, that's how we met, this email invitation to dinner, which by the way is what I thought this was. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so, David, say a little bit about how you're drawing together this community of weavers. How, how did you know to email Lisa? Well, the only insight was, um, by the way, now that I co get to be around people like this, I go back and I cover politics, and I, I hate it. Like, these people are so self-absorbed. It's like I... Yeah. Um, and so, basically, we thought the problem of social iso isolation is the core problem, and we don't have the answer in Washington, but out there, people are, have the answer. Yeah. And some of it is people who run organizations, but most of it is not. It's not people who radically alter their lives. They've just changed the way they are in a little way. Yeah. And so we ran into a guy named Trabian Shorter who lives in Miami, and he was interviewing a lady who was, he asked her in his neighborhood, do you have time to volunteer? She said, no, I, I don't have time for that. And she said, well, what are you doing? I'm helping kids out of elementary school as a crossing guard. Are you being paid? No. And, but, and then I've got to leave because I'm taking food to the hospital. And he says, you don't volunteer? I said, no, I don't, I'm just being a neighbor. This is what we do. Yeah. And so it's a way of being, of defining just what supposed, you're supposed to do. And that's true for educators, too. Yeah. I mean, if anybody's a weaver, educators are weavers. Yeah. I mean, I've covered education since the Nation at Risk report in 1983. And we've had big schools, small schools, charters, vouchers. But the element of the fact of education is that people learn from people they love. Yeah. And if you don't create that relationship, then they're not gonna learn, they're not gonna be with you. I had a weird experience in a college classroom. I was teaching when I was in that weird period of my life, and a friend was coming up to help me out. And I have office hours at a bar between 9.30 and one in the morning, just because it's more fun. I don't recommend it for a lot of you if there are other people, but especially at pre-K level, it's not good. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but I said to the class, I, uh, I'm gonna have to cancel office hours. I'm going through a hard time, and my friend's coming to help me. That's all I said, nothing, no. And I got about 15 notes that night from, about, from the 24 of my students said, I just want you to know, I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you. And it changed the class for the whole rest of the term. Yeah. Because just Professor Brooks was no longer some bloviating faraway guy. He was just another broken guy trying to get through life. Yeah. And that connection in the classroom was very illustrative to me of how we all can be weavers yeah. or we all can be rippers. So probably half of this audience are people in some way or another work in education tech. And the EdTech world is always thinking about the question of scale. It's a preoccupation. Um, I want to get at this question of scale a little bit with each of you, and then we can open it up for questions. And first, I'll start with Darius and then with Lisa. My question is, do you believe that 
the values that you're trying to live. And the movement that David says you're a part of can be grown. Is there actually something there that can be grown? Is it possible to scale or grow the kind of values that you're acting on? Uh, certainly. And there's no better place to start that movement than right here at South by Southwest EDU. Because as all of us know in this room, uh, this country starts and stops in our schools. Um, when I look at this, the current state of the country, and David hit on a lot of um, the facts of where we are, uh, I, I don't get discouraged. I get optimistic. Because with where we are, we have a unique opportunity to grow and to be better and to evolve and to innovate. You know, when I look at, and we, again, this is the, probably the word we shouldn't mention here at, at South by Southwest EDU, but when I look at a, a president like Trump, I don't get disengaged. I get optimistic. Because I don't look at Trump and say, okay, this is a guy, He's X, Y, and Z. You can feel whatever way you want to feel about him. I see him as a product of a system that has been created. And when we look at him, it's like, okay, how do we turn this on the flip side? Where we are currently in America has produced this. So how do we take a step back and say this? We want to produce people that are thoughtful, yeah. that are loving, yeah. that are caring. And we have an opportunity to do so. And people in this room, whether it's through ed tech, whether it's in charter schools, whether it's in private schools, whether it's through policy, we have an opportunity to shape the viewpoints of young people and in many ways, older people going forward. We have the power of gods in this generation. We can build, we can destroy, we can uh, genetically modify species, we can clone, we can do all of these things. And with this power comes great responsibility where we have to have this greater sense that we have to find our moral, uh, our moral sense and our moral grounding. Yeah. We have to constantly be preaching that to young kids because they're gonna inherit this world that we're creating. So that combination of preaching and doing, of words and deeds, can create, can change minds and motivate individuals to connect with one another and that connection can then build a better society. It's That's understand, it's, it's a unique, it's, it's a, Uncle Ben was a philosopher like we've never known before. Yeah. When he sat down with Spider-Man and he told him, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> you know? But, but no, I, I mean this, and I mean this very genuinely. We have to understand this as a people and where we've gone and where technology has taken us is that we do have this immense power. Yeah. Um, even when this, we, we joke about the million people watching this today, but even the four of us sitting on this stage, we have an immense responsibility of what comes out of our mouths. We can come up here and spread hate speech, mm -hmm. you know, divisiveness, this, that, but we have responsibility to say, we need to come together as a country, no matter how you feel on one side or another. And we have to be, always be mindful of that in the times. We don't have the privilege of maybe the generations before us where I can sit in this small box, in this small community, in this small town, and I can say these things and it doesn't matter. Yeah. We are constantly spreading these messages across the world and we have to be mindful of what are we spreading? Are we spreading love or are we spreading dissent? Yeah, thank you. Lisa, can localism and neighborliness scale to the societal level? Absolutely, and I've already seen it happen. Uh, we have a core of seven kids that started Apex 10 years ago in my house. Many of them have gone on. They've created little mini Apexes where they go. They're volunteering, they're doing these things. Um, and even an unconsciousness I will commend them when they come back and visit and they're going, we're not doing anything except loving people. And that's what it is. The, the core of it is, can we really love our neighbor as ourselves? And can it spread? Absolutely it can spread. I used to be in public health. That was where I started. And one of the things that when an epidemic is coming that we would never do is this put a person who is infected with, in a closed area with another large group of people who then become infected. This could be an infection, if you will, a pandemic of love, if we are intentional about it. Yeah. David, your thoughts on... Yeah. I mean, the, th the thing I've concluded is the relationships, like with the kids, A-OK, -okay, with your guys, that they're take a lot of time to build a relationship, to build trust. 
And to some degree, they don't scale. But as I said before, norms scale. If you shift what's the accepted form of behavior, how do we live? What's the right way to live? You can shift culture, and then you have these vast effects. If you grew up in Chicago in the 1950s, you grew up in really tight communities. You didn't say, I'm from Chicago. You said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski. Because yeah. your neighborhood was just right there. And that had a lot of good community. It was, had to be changed, because it tolerated a lot of racism, sexism, anti-Semitism. The food was really boring. So we, <laughs> we chopped up that culture. And we created a much more individualistic culture. Uh, individualistic in lifestyle, individualistic in economics. And we, that was good. We needed to do that. Yeah. But we've done that for 60 years, and we sort of run out the string on a hyper-individualistic culture. And so we sort of need to shift back to something else. Not to go back, but to shift forward to something else. And when I look at how societies change, they, the, the best model, I think, is America in the 1890s to 1910. It was like our own era, hyper-individualistic, big wave of immigration, economic transition, a lot of political corruption. And it, change came in three waves. The first wave was a shift in culture. They moved from the social Darwin movement to the social gospel movement, which was very individualistic to very communal. And then they had a civic renaissance. Within five years in the 1890s, you saw the creation of the Boys and Girl Scouts, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Settlement House Movement, the Environmental Movement, the Union Movement, the NAACP. They all created things because we got to bring our country together. And then eventually, they had the Progressive Movement. So it was culture, civic, politics. And I think that's probably the way we do it. We, we just decide it's a different way to live. We're going to be weavers, not rippers. Yep. And when everybody makes that decision, they can all figure out their own way to do it. But society can sort of move over because we have this collective problem. Let's check out the questions now. Um, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm reading a monitor here that tells me um, some of the questions that are asked and the degree of others in the audience that have said, oh, I like that question. Um, so uh, one question that has 20 likes by it from Jordan Tinney. How do our teachers avoid the type of isolation and loneliness that David Brooks speaks about. Pain that is not transformed gets transmitted. How, thoughts, either, either of you. How, how do teachers, those working on the front lines, not get dragged down and burned out by a feeling of isolation and futility that can come if you don't see progress or feel supported? Oh, that is, that is a, very, uh, a very deep question. And thank you, Jordan, for submitting that. I think this, this begs a much larger question to what is going to be the role of schools going forward. Uh, in any movement, you think you're constantly chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away until one day the ceiling breaks and then the floodgates open and you see the change. We are at a pivotal point where it does feel, because even I can admit myself, there's moments where I've sat up late at night really questioning and asking God, like, why am I here? Why do you have me doing this? Uh, I'll go into the office and spend Lord knows too much time on this work, and then I'll get a call and saying that another one of our young people has been incarcerated or even worse, murdered. And I asked myself, God, why have you put me in this position? Why? Like, we're not seeing the results. But in that, that's me being a little naive, because when I shift my energy and focus on the things that aren't going right, mm -hmm. I miss out on the kid that we've sent to college. Mm -hmm. I miss out on the kid that went out and got their GED, the one that's being a better father to their child. In this work, there's always gains being made. We just have to shift our point of view and understand they may not be the ones that we want to focus on. Yeah. There's always victories being won. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that you say, you, you open the, the answer by saying shift the focus also to look at the unit of the school. Certainly. So you can see progress around you, even if your immediate, direct, hands-on work is not yet yielding the rewards you're looking for, the transformation you're looking for. Uh, Lisa. Um, pain is real. Pain of the heart, pain of uh, the soul, pain of the body, and pain is it's necessary to be transmit, transformed or it will be transmitted. I would encourage teachers to find your community, yeah. find your soul 
soulmate, if you will, it, within the structure that you have. Work with one another. Understand also that your students' pain is not against you. They are raging against the forces of the world and we can't take it personally. We must look and see what can we do to interrupt those cycles of pain and so that we together can transform. So you almost predicted a question by Charles Tsai with your answer that now has 64 people with the thumbs up, um, which is this, half our students feel disengaged at school. How can schools be places of belonging and help reweave the social fabric? And so is there something in particular you would like to see happen at schools that would have the effect of engaging people differently, students differently? And one of the things that happens at Apex is people come and they expect to see neat rows of children working on workbooks. That's a program. I don't know about you, Dan, but I've never learned about relationships from a workbook. We only learn about relationships by practicing relationships and we practice it in context. Find the context of your students. We play street ball at Apex, no blood, no foul. <laughs> so, because that's the context like in, yeah. which, <laughs> in which the community learns to communicate and, and how we transform this, co this competition and yeah. to keep it from being conflict. So how can that translate to schools? Find those spaces where children have things in common, where we can begin to weave, we can get our heads up out of the desks and the workbook, look at one another, truly see one another. Yeah. Find those spaces, they exist. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I was asked, I was a part of a conversation, couldn't be more than two weeks ago at this point at the AI Institute in DC mm -hmm. with um, a, a man that's actually gonna be presenting here, uh, Tim Shriver. And a representative from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative said something that was so poignant, but it was in passing kind of in their larger conversation, going back to the original point of what is going to be the role of schools going forward, um, where we stand right here as a country. Um, and if I think about, and I'm dating myself, I'm, I'm, I haven't been around that long, but when I, when I look at uh, schools and their effectiveness, specifically in relation to the American context over the last five, six decades, um, they were effective at a certain point. The way schools were created, put kids in rows, we're gonna give them the A's, raise your hand when you wanna to go to the bathroom, and that put us into a period of rapid expansion as America. We can, no, I don't think anybody can debate that the American education system was effective. It pushed us to the ultimate point of where we're now the richest country in the history of the world. But now we see where we've hit this point of decline and we have to ask ourselves, okay, how do we shift our mindsets and saying what needs to be the role of American schools going forward? And the point that was made at this dinner was this idea of uh, localism in education. Where we have these sweeping, sweeping education plans where we're gonna do standardized testing and in every 50 states, if kids don't learn these things, then this school is gonna lose their funding. And these are the books that we want every kid across the country reading. But we have to understand that whether you're in South Dakota, whether you're in Washington, D.C., in California, in Appalachia, or in an urban city, you're experiencing America in a very different way. I think we can all agree on that. And we have to understand that schools have a role to innovate and say, what does my community need? Mm -hmm. There's communities struggling everywhere across this country. And I talk about this in context of Washington, D.C., and I think about our schools like Anacostia and Ballou and Wilson and Cesar Chavez. And I say, okay, what would it look like for an education system to say, you know what, let's throw away all of the workbooks. And let's say, okay, you go to Anacostia High School in Southeast DC, and we're gonna teach a curriculum that is specifically based on what this community needs. We have roaring gun violence issues. Yeah. We have an AIDS epidemic. The kids in this school lack the basic um, skills of hygiene and nutrition. And we're gonna create curriculums that teach specifically to this community. We talk about students being disengaged. How about we make it practical to their lives? Yeah. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, thank you, uh, thank you. So two profound answers. Uh, I wanna encourage those of you that are interested in that question to go to the Asp Institute's website where we have a report of a national commission that we led for about three years on social and emotional learning and its relationship to academic learning. It's called the SEED Commission. And some of these questions 
really get worked through there from the perspective of classroom practice, system reform, and future scholarship. Uh, Darius, your, your answer just uh, triggered a response to a, a question that then is, is just like a perfect flow. Um, and it comes from Avery and Anderson. The question is that David Brooks has stated, we are all broken together. What does history, especially the histories of black and brown people and women have to say about this, the idea that we're all broken together? Me? Yeah. Uh, well, I will say when I started this work uh, nine months or so and before all these trips to all these communities around the country, I thought, well, we've got a lot of divides in this country. There's an economic divide. There's a political divide. There's a racial divide. There are other divides. I think I, my mind has shifted from this experience that for, for historic reasons, the racial divide is the core divide. It's the core sin and it has a moral radiating effect on all of society. And somehow that has to be put at absolute the center of every conversation. Because you can't quite get at all the others unless we address the core sin. Yeah. And that, that has, it's just come up in every conversation and come up to the top as sort of just the power of a moral wrong yeah. that permeates through the society. And how we deal with it, I, I would say, um, I would say what, what brings us together? One thing that brings us together is a common story, a community is an organization around a common story. And so we have an American story, but that story has to be adjusted to take all the other stories into it. And we now have a lot of different stories. We've got to move to one story, but that includes everybody. The second thing, a community is a group of people united around a common project. In the book of Exodus, we're getting super religious up here. In the, book of, in the Genesis, the creation of the universe is covered in like nine verses. In Exodus, the creation of this little thing called the tabernacle is hundreds of verses. Why is that? Because they're trying to create the Israelites into one people, so they give them something to build together. So having a conversation, what are we building together across difference? Third, having a norm where every American has a reach relationship with somebody completely unlike themselves. Yeah. And so that is something. And then the final thing, what, as we travel around the country, what unites people most? common love for their kids. Yeah. And so if you can build a community around a school and a school system, you can cross a lot of differences and get to know another. And that's on the intimate level. Uh, just tr tr kindness is a skill. You got to teach it. We don't teach kindness, but there's an actual skill to it. Then it's on the neighborhood level, uh, just parents working together for their kids. And then finally, on the regional level, I've become a fan of collective impact structures like Strive Together where you bring everybody in the region together around the raising of the young. And they're all part of one conversation. And the youth are just degalvanizing yeah. force. Yeah. And the one final thing I wanted to say is, one of the things we found is that people who do this kind of work, formally or informally, they're like nurses without nursing schools. There's no formal training structure to help people build community. And there has to be curriculum for that. There have to be programs in schools that say, if you want to social but here's what we know. Mm -hmm. And we've got to build an educational infrastructure for people who are weaving. Yeah. Um, is there anything on that last question either of you would like to address? I think what it, and another way of saying the question is there are these, these historic uh, systemic inequities and injustice built into the project of this society and, and most societies. And is, is the weaver notion transcending those deep historic facts of history, or is it able to be located within them? It's that America has a very scarred history. Uh, but understanding that we're going to move forward, and the only way that we can move forward is together. I think David hit something that was so, so powerful in saying just having at least one person that has, I'm paraphrasing, but just one person outside of your your immediate tribe, somebody that you can live and learn from. For me, that's a guy named Frank Luntz, and some of the people in this room may know him. I was actually just speaking to him backstage before I came on, like, I'm really nervous, man. They didn't tell me <laughs> there's gonna be this many people. Uh, but this is a white, he's, I, I don't know, he's about 60, Jewish, super conservative, uh, and we'll debate and we'll have conversations. But in listening to his points of views, I've grown as a person. And it shifted even some ways that I see the world. 
And if all of us in our everydays can go out there and make an effort that I'm going to go out there, I may not agree with this person. I may never invite him over for Thanksgiving dinner. But I'm going to keep somebody in my life that will challenge me and force me to think outside of the box. Yeah. Yeah. Lisa, and we're, we're running out of time, so maybe Lisa, after this, I'm going to ask one lightning round fast question, and then we'll have reached the end of this panel. Sure. Um, when I first began this work, I had the common notion that we were all on a journey. Some of us were just further ahead than others. I quickly learned from the first group of gang members that I taught in Los Angeles in the 90s that that was a fallacy. It just wasn't so. We are all on a journey, yes, and they are all our journeys, but it is incumbent upon us, if we are to move forward on any of our journeys, that we link arms and work with one another and join arms and move forward together in whatever that journey is. And I think that that's where if this movement is going to continue, like there is no curriculum, but it's up to us to link arms together on all of our distinctive journeys so that we can move forward as one. That's beautiful, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna skip the lightning round, and what I'd like to do is to invite all who are here, if you would like to do this, to have further conversation with Darius and Lisa and David to go to the expo uh, uh, area. Uh, the convention center where there's a set of installations set up and Weave has one. It's number 731. And I think we're going to hustle the three of you down there so that you can then have one-to-one -one conversations with anyone who's here. Um, please and David for leading this project.